morning guys. Uh, so over the last two classes we've been looking at uh, sort of two-dimensional setups. Uh, we started off with a lawnmower style question as I pushed down along the handle. Uh, we saw how we had to break up uh, the diagonal into the x and the y components here. Uh, sometimes the normal force was actually a little bit bigger. In the lawnmower case it was a little bit smaller in the cart case here. Uh, but we sort of worked through those problems here with a free body diagram. Eventually you just want to figure out what your net force is figure out who's the tug of war, figure out who ends up winning, and that'll eventually help you uh, find the acceleration to therefore help you figure out um, what happens to the object. Uh, towards the end of yesterday's class here, we started taking a look at uh, gravity on slopes. Basically, gravity pulls directly downwards. It doesn't care that you're on a ramp. Uh, we actually needed to break down gravity into the two parts. Part of it is called the squeeze. Basically, it squeezes the object here onto the ramp. That's why I label it as F in. It's always the cosine of the triangle that we get. Uh, and then the F down is the part that's actually sliding down uh, the triangle. Hopefully, uh, by working through the worksheet, uh, you've been able to get some practice with the numerical values here. I'm just going to show you one of those other setups here where, because I'm not given enough information, I might need to drag uh, the variable through the problem. Normally, I'm not going to give you a question that is as hard as this, but this hopefully helps you rehash some of the major concepts and uh, shows you a little bit more. In this question here, I can actually figure out the mu just by figuring out what the angle is. So uh, if you just uh, work through this sort of thought experiment with me here, uh, we're going to start off here with just a ramp. I'm going to have a mass m. Now, it's nice if they actually give you the number, like 10 kilograms, 50 kilograms or so. I can actually literally multiply that in. But in this question here, I'm going to do it completely with variables. We'll see uh, how we do with this. So we have a mass m. Let's imagine that this one here, we're told this mass is actually sliding downwards at a constant velocity. Right. And some of your questions here were uh, given this phrase here, constant velocity. So it is moving. Intuitively, you'd say, oh, it's moving. There's a force. Remember, in Newton's first law, it says a force is not needed for motion. In fact, in this situation, if your velocity is constant, that means you actually have no acceleration. And if you have no acceleration, if you look at Newton's second law, F net is supposed to equal to MA. If acceleration is zero, that actually means the net force is zero. Now, normally people know that. Well, if there's no force, obviously I'm not moving. But in this case here, I'm saying, well, no, the object is sliding. If there's no net force here, it just guarantees that there's not going to be any change in speed. If you were moving to begin with, you can just continue moving at that rate there. There's still no net force on you. Just like that analogy, if we were in space, if this object here were just moving along at 10 meter per second, as long as I don't uh, influence it somehow with some external force, it's just going to continue moving off at this constant velocity. It's still in motion, uh, but it's the speed that's not changing. So there's that m there. We're going to actually calculate here, uh, well, what is the free body diagram on this picture? Well, we have an fg that pulls downwards. Uh, fg is broken down into two components, one part that's into the ramp, f in. The other part here is f down, that's trying to slide this object down the ramp. Here's the right angle. We had said that the ramp would be up at an angle of theta, and then by doing some trigonometry here, we had actually figured out the theta was that inward angle there. The other force I needed to worry about here was Fn. Fn is always perpendicular to the surface because the surface this time is actually ramped at a diagonal. The Fn is perpendicular to it. In this case here, because I see that the object is back to moving downwards, friction always opposes motion, so the friction force is actually going in this problem here to be upwards. We found on the very last question from yesterday, because the object itself was actually sliding upwards, friction actually switched to going the opposite direction here. Friction actually helped F down in that situation, uh, but this is a more sort of common setup. So let's just sort of work our way through. I know I didn't really ask you a question here, but let's just see uh, how far we can get. We usually start off here with FG. FG is given by M times G. So normally what we do is we take the mass, 10 kilograms, and multiply by 9.8. I know what the G is, right? So I could put 9.8 there. If you like, you can say m times 9.8 and write it out as 9.8m. I'm just going to leave it as mg for now, just in case I end up on another planet and I have this ramp with me. Let me see what happens to this g later on. I'm going to break down gravity into the two parts. Part of it goes in, part of it goes down. The in part is the adjacent side. So f in is equal to fg cos theta, and the f down is equal to fg sine theta. Now, you'll notice I have a lot of variables here, right? I don't have numbers. I'm sort of feeling uncomfortable here. But what this formula says is wherever you see fg, you can actually punch in mg. I see an fg in those two places. Why not substitute those into there? f in is going to be mg cos theta, and the f down is actually going to be mg sine theta, right? 
So I have no clue what the mass is. I would have known it's 9.8, but let's just leave that as a G for now. But if you give me these numbers here, all I need to do is punch through the math, multiply mass and G and sine theta, and I got F down. All right? uh, in the Y prime direction, in the new vertical direction on my slope, we're going to see that this mass here is just sliding along. It's neither physically going into the ramp nor popping off the ramp. That tells me that the Fn actually has to cancel out Fn. So let me just draw you a picture of that here. In the y prime direction, the Fn, right, the normal force from the surface, has to perfectly match the inward part of gravity. Not all of gravity, because you notice the direction is different. This is not directly head to head against the straight down line. This is only head to head against the Fn. Well, I have the expression for Fn. Fn is actually this mg cos theta. If I now write Fn, is supposed to counteract Fn. Sometimes they say it's a positive Fn. It's the opposite direction of Fn. Well, that's just going to be mg cos theta, right? Because I had my Fn formula there. So, uh, I know, again, it feels a little bit weird because, oh, I'm not having numbers to this here. But the second that you give me numbers, I can just crunch it right through, and I have it. So, uh, Fn is also equal to mg cos theta. At this point here, we sort of get stuck because I can try to switch over to x prime for my new sort of horizontal. We knew we had the downward part of gravity, so that's this part here sliding it down the ramp. The friction force is actually going against it. We actually get a little bit stuck because, um, let's do our formula for friction here. Friction force is supposed to be mu times Fn. Again, they haven't quite given me a number for mu, but if they give it to me here, there's a sort of mu value for the roughness between the surfaces here. It's going to be mu times Fn. I have a mu, and I have Fn as mg cos theta. I'm going to multiply that in, so mu. Wherever I see Fn, I can type in mg cos theta. So I'm going to punch that in there, mg cos theta. Right? So still following along here, ff is currently mu mg cos theta. And now the question is, well, can I figure out this sort of constant velocity bit? Remember, we've been saying, if constant velocity, it means there's no acceleration. It means A is zero. It means that the net force is actually zero. So whichever is the tug of war, this time the tug of war is between F down that's pulling it downwards and FF is uh, going upwards. Because they told me right from the start we have constant velocity, the F net actually has to be zero. So what can you tell me about this tug of war here between F down and FF if the tug of wars end up canceling? If they cancel, we can then uh, sort of solve our problem here. FF actually has to equal to F down. For FF, we had this expression, mu mg cos theta. So I'm just going to write that here. Mu mg cos theta. For the F down, I had the expression right from the start, which is mg sine theta. So this is actually the mg sine theta. These two had to equal because there was no acceleration. If there is an acceleration, I can't do this equality. I can't do that math there. And what I want to show you here in this way of formulating it here is we're actually going to see some of the letters actually cancel out. For example, I have my m that actually cancels out. I can divide both sides by m. So what that actually tells me is physically speaking, it doesn't matter the mass of the object. This could be a 10 kilogram object. It could be a 3,000 kilogram object. The mass doesn't influence uh, the speed at which it's going downwards. In fact, the 9.8 also doesn't matter. I divide g, I divide g, that actually cancels out. Um, since I have sort of thetas, I'm going to collect the thetas onto one side here. I'm going to now have the formula here. The mu is actually equal to sine theta, uh, cos theta, divided by cos theta. And this actually gives me, once I cancel out the mass and cancel out the gravity here, uh, this actually gives me a way to actually figure out, well, how rough are the surfaces? This is our coefficient of friction. Again, that could be split up into static and um, uh, kinetic later on it's actually given by just the angle itself. And in fact, mathematically here, when you do Sokotoa, uh, for the sine part, uh, sine is equal to opposite over hypotenuse. The cosine is actually the adjacent over hypotenuse. When I have a fraction divided by a fraction, I can think of it as being divided by the reciprocal. You actually have this on your formula sheet. I'm just going to show you how this uh, ends up here. Well, the hypotenuses actually die away, and we end up having opposite over adjacent. Well, I know opposite over adjacent is actually just a tan function. So we finally, through this derivation, it was a little bit weird because we had to drag uh, letters through this. I, didn't, I really didn't uh, have numbers going. But sine theta over cos theta actually ends up being tangent of theta. So pretty much what that's saying is if you want a qualitative way of actually f finding 
uh, what the mu is, the coefficient of friction, all you need to do is take the angle of the ramp. It could be 10 degrees, 20 degrees, or whatever. If you take the tangent of that angle, that actually gives you the friction coefficient. So that's sort of uh, something that's predicted out of the physics without us actually punching through the numbers. Uh, majority of your questions will actually have numbers to it, but I just wanted to show you that uh, to follow up uh, our slopes problem. For today, we're going to switch over to uh, our first simple machine. Uh, this guy here is actually called a pulley system. Uh, it's going to be somewhat uh, easier than the slope problems we've been doing. There's no diagonals for us to cross out, but uh, again, just a little bit of a twist. Uh, it's a new setup. So. Uh, as you look at a pulley as a simple machine, the whole point of a pulley is to uh, help make uh, work easier. Um, basically, there's a task that requires a certain amount of energy input. Um, the machine is going to play around with uh, how the force is actually delivered, uh, over what distances are delivered. It's going to try to maximize um, uh, the amount of force where you just input in a very little force and it sort of gives you a mechanical advantage. It gives you a force that's multiplied. So. For a pulley system here, I want to show you two uh, main setups for this. The first uh, setup here is called a free hanging pulley. This is probably what we picture when I say pulley. A free hanging pulley here essentially has, we have a pulley. A pulley has a string that's sort of tied over top of it here, and essentially it's free hanging, meaning I just sort of loop it to the roof or hang it off a crane or something like that. What I'm going to have here is I'm going to have two masses on either side. Uh, I'm going to do this with numbers here just for simplicity. Let's say the mass on the left side here is 2 kilograms, the mass on the right side here is 5 kilograms. Um, same sort of style of question. I'm interested in you finding for me uh, what is the acceleration of the system. Let's study the dynamics, let's use a free body diagram, let's study the forces, and let's figure out who's, uh, who's going to win in the tug of war. For this mass here on the left side, we have two forces that act on it. We have an Fg, right? Gravity always pulls down on masses. I'm going to call it Fg1 for object number 1. I know the string has to be doing something because if I cut this string here, this mass is going to fall. The string force, sure, you can call it an applied force. Usually we call it a tension force, T1. How about on the other side? On the other side here is a 5 kilogram. Sure, it's going to be a bigger force of gravity. Let's call it Fg2. And also, again, if I cut this string here, the string is trying to support it against the 5 kilogram. The string is also going to be a T2. Here's actually where Newton's third law actually saves the day. Because we only have one string, when I have one string here on this side, it's actually trying to pull upwards. On the other side, it's actually trying to pull um, upwards on the 5 kilogram here. You see that it actually has to pull equal and opposite on both sides. It's not like the string can be tighter on one side and not as tight on the other side because they're both connected together here. So based on Newton's third law, let me write this down for you here. From Newton's third law, T1 has to be equal and opposite T2. So what that actually allows me to do here is, as long as I'm one and the same string, whatever tightness is on one side is the tightness on the other. I can just call this T, and I can call this T. I don't really need a T1 or T2. It demonstrated for you the equal, because it's the same tautness along the string, but it's opposite. The string is trying to contract on this side and also contract on this side here. Now, intuitively, we'd say, well, the only reason why the string has a tautness at all, the 5 kilogram is pulling down on the string. It is somehow translating into the T there. That's correct. The 2 kilogram as well, it's pulling down on the string here. It's trying to cause the, this side to fall to the left here. It's actually pulling up. The tautness is also due to this gravity as well. You can't, however, just go, okay, well, if the tautness is due to this gravity here, let's just find gravity m times g. Uh, let's just do that here. So fg1 is supposed to be m times g. So 2 times 9.8. The gravity on the first mass here is 19.6. The gravity on the other mass, 5 times 9.8. Right, m times g, that's always a good starting point because it's just m times g. Uh, it's equal to 49. I can't just look at this and say, okay, this 5 had a 49 uh, newtons, so therefore the tension along the other side has to be 49. The problem here is, what I've done here is I've actually just taken a snapshot of this picture. I've taken a snapshot because if I run the clock, when I have a heavier mass, this system is not going to stay at rest. This mass here is going to actually start accelerating. We're actually going to accelerate. Uh, sort of in this clockwise direction towards the right. Because there is that acceleration to it and forces cause that acceleration, even though these tensions here are sort of indirectly related to the force of gravity on the opposite side, uh, we still need to work out our calculations to actually try to find uh, what the tug of war is going to be. But there we go. 
We've calculated the forces that we know. Fg1 on this side is 19.6, on the other side is 49. I want you to think of the system here. Because of the string, they are tied together as a system. They will either both go in the clockwise direction, or they'll both go in the sort of counterclockwise direction. So what you can think about here is you have a 2 kilogram mass. Sure, we have a string that's connecting them. We have a 5 kilogram. They actually will behave as a 7 kilogram system. The FG1 is trying to allow the 2 kilogram to fall downwards. I'm just going to demonstrate that to the left. So let's say that's FG1. Earlier we had said there was a T1 on, on, along the string. The string is a nice tool that actually delivers force here sort of around this angle. It's sort of it's pulled along the string itself. And this string here is actually going to have a T1 on the 2 kilogram side, a T2 on the opposite side. We had done our equal and opposite. So we saw that the T1 and T2 cancel out. It's as if the tautness along the string here cancels out on both sides. And the only other force that we have is actually an FG2 on the other side. For FG2 on the other side, that's trying to cause the system to fall to the right. Let's see what we get then. If we are in total, we act like a 7 kilogram object. We could either slide to the right or slide to the left. I'm being pulled to the left. The force we calculated was just the force of gravity on the 2 kilogram. The force is the 19.6 newtons to the left. Going to the right, we actually have a force of 49 newtons. Who wins? Yeah, well, well, you wouldn't knew that from the beginning. Well, the heavier mass, right? Heavier mass pulls the lighter mass. Fine, no problem. And in fact, how much does the wind buy? We always go bigger number minus smaller number. If I want to find the net force, I would go 49 minus 19.6. This gives me here 29.4 newtons. This is actually my net force. This is my overall win. It was Fg2 minus Fg1. It was bigger minus smaller. And the net force is equal to m times a. Be careful, even though the individual forces gave you the 19.6 and the 49, because we are hooked up as a system, we really do behave like a 7 kilogram object. If I have 29.4 unbalanced force heading to the right, and I'm a 7 kilogram object, what is my overall acceleration? I can solve your way through for there. The acceleration 29.4 divided by 7. Uh, the acceleration is 4.2. And how do I indicate the direction to you? If you have a picture, no problem. I can see, while well, the acceleration is sort of up and over like that. You can say in words here, this acceleration here is clockwise. Sometimes they say uh, CK for clockwise or CW for clockwise. Um, CCW counterclockwise, anticlockwise going the opposite way. So just to show you, okay, if we are a system together, we get pulled uh, together so that we have 4.2. The acceleration on both masses have to be the same. You can imagine if one actually accelerated faster than the other, the string would actually snap. So we managed to calculate the acceleration, uh, and we sort of ignored this problem of tension. Usually in this problem, however, part B of the question, let's say part A, I didn't actually write that down for you, uh, part A was just to find this acceleration. Let's say part B of the question is to actually calculate the tension. So usually a follow-up to this pulley question here. I want you to calculate the tension uh, along the string. What we had said be from before is from Newton's third law, they're equal and opposite. They sort of cancel out. The trouble is, because we studied the whole system altogether, those tensions here had canceled out. What we're going to do at this point here is we're actually going to apply this same Newton's second law, this F net equals MA again. The nice thing about this physical law here is you can actu actually apply Newton's second law, sure, to the entire system all at once, right? That's when the tensions cancel out. Or what we're going to see in this problem, I'm going to apply the F net equals MA just for the mass on the left or just for the mass on the right. Uh, we can do them individually to actually figure out what the tension is. So let me just resketch that diagram for you so you know what I'm talking about here. We have a 2 kilogram mass. It was being pulled down. Our FG1 was our 19.6. There was a T1. Earlier, I had looked at the entire system, the Ts that canceled out. This time, I just want to focus on doing Newton's second law on this mass here. We had found the overall acceleration. The overall acceleration was 4.2 in the clockwise direction. For the mass on the left side, it's actually going to go upwards at 4.2 meter per second squared. So let's try to do Newton's second law. Newton's second law says F net is equal to M8. The F net, again, is not a force in itself. It's just what's left over, what's the unbalance from the tug of war. In this case here, between T1 and FG1, who's bigger to allow me to actually accelerate in the upward direction? Well, if this is the tug of war here. If FG1 wins, the 2 kilogram actually starts falling. We know that doesn't happen, so T1 has to be bigger. So I go bigger minus smaller. 
t1 minus fg1 has to equal to the mass. Earlier we said 7 kilograms because we were looking at the entire system. This time I'm only applying it to this mass over here. So it's actually just a mass of 2 kilograms. So let's call that mass 1 and times the acceleration that we got. So let's plug away through the numbers here. I don't know what my, my t1 was that I had cancelled out earlier. t1 minus off whatever 19.6 is has to give you my mass. This time it's only the mass of the 2 kilogram accelerating at 4.2. Let's figure out how much I need to win by, and let's figure out here, T1 has to not only counteract 19.6, but also give you this net force. So the net force here is actually 8.4. I need to have an overall win of 8.4 for a 2 kilogram object to actually accelerate upwards. The T1 has to pull harder than gravity uh, by 8.4, so therefore T1, 19.6 plus 8.4, gives you 28 newtons. And as I had uh, alluded to, yes, the tension is somehow related to the mass on the other side, but you saw that the mass on the other side actually had 49 newtons. You can't just say 49 newtons on the 5 kilogram because that causes the string tension. Oh, this is 49. What's misleading again is when I run the clock, the system isn't static. The system just doesn't sit there. The system actually does move to the right. Uh, just for practice here, just to guarantee that the tension forces actually cancel out, I'm going to look on the other side now. On the other side here, we actually had a 5 kilogram mass. This one here had an Fg, this I labeled as Fg2. Fg2 is actually going to be uh, 49 newtons we have from earlier. Earlier we had said this was T2. Let's say we didn't believe Newton's third law that it's equal and opposite. Hopefully if I do this calculation, I should find the tension is equally 28 newtons, the string is pulling equal on either side, and it actually ends up canceling out. So let's just try it out here. The thing to be careful of here is as you fall along the string, as you go over the pulley and over to the other side, notice that the acceleration on this side is actually downwards. So we would actually need to worry about positives and negatives. I really don't want to. What I want to do here is I just want to use my free body diagram. So this time, we already studied the entire system to find the overall system's acceleration. And now we're applying Newton's second law just for each part individually. So let's try Newton's second law again. F net is equal to m a. On the right-hand side, the tug-of-war is between Fg2 and T2. Be careful on the right-hand side, this mass actually falls. If I want to keep the acceleration still as a positive number, instead of going T2 minus Fg2, you'll always get it right if you go bigger number minus smaller number. Because I know this object ends up falling, it's actually going to be Fg2 minus T2. When you compare that to the earlier question, you might say, well, how come earlier was tension minus gravity? It's because on this side, the tension has to be bigger so it can go upwards. This time, it's still gravity against tension, but because I know this mass here actually accelerates downwards, instead of actually putting a negative for acceleration and getting confused there, I just go between the tug-of-war, Fg is pulling down, T2 is actually pulling upwards, Fg2 minus tension, bigger minus smaller, is equal to just the second mass times the acceleration. And that way you can keep the acceleration 4.2. Uh, let's crunch our way through the math here. Uh, the force of gravity on just the 5 kilogram is 49. Let's imagine I don't know what the T2 is just yet. This time I'm just a 5 kilogram. I'm using Newton's second law just on the one side. And I can keep this as a positive 4.2. What's my net win have to be? 5 times 4.2. I need to have a win of 21 newtons going downwards for a 5 kilogram object to have the system's acceleration. Well, what is tension actually supporting it? The string is definitely doing something. If I go 49 minus 21 here, it gives you that 28. So it just verifies for us uh, from earlier uh, Newton's third law. The string not only transfers the forces, it connects these two masses into a system. The tensions are actually equal and opposite. Right? So for pulley systems here, we're always going to do that sort of setup. We're going to deal with um, the system all at once first. We're going to first sort of ignore tensions. Right? I, tensions are too, de too detailed. I, can't, I, don't have, I have too many unknowns. What we're going to do is we're going to study the whole system all together, find the system's acceleration, find out how this whole system is going to twist, and then in case they ask you for tension, I can then reapply Newton's second law, just apply it to each side one by one uh, to calculate the tension. We are making a slightly simplifying assumption here. First thing, the string itself is taut, so basically uh, it doesn't snap or it doesn't uh, sh uh, break on you. And also, anytime you have surfaces rubbing, we would expect there's a friction because there was no mention that like what the friction is as the rope sort of wrapped around the pulley itself, we can assume frictionless. If there was a friction, we would actually need to deal with that force as well. Right? 
So what we're going to do here is I'm going to transition over to a, another setup of a pulley. We're going to be doing pretty much the same analysis. Let's find out the system's acceleration and let's see if we can then calculate the tensions. Okay, so this next setup here is going to be what's referred to as a tabletop pulley. So our second setup of a pulley. Uh, let's see if we can apply uh, what we've just learned here from uh, the uh, free hanging pulley here to this tabletop system. Uh, so a standard tabletop pulley here, uh, as the name suggests here, the pulley is sort of hanging off a table. Uh, what we're going to have is still a free hanging mass. Uh, let me put some numbers to this here. Uh, let's say this is a three kilogram mass. Um, uh, so it's hung by a string here. The string here sort of connects on the other side here. Uh, let's make it a just a four kilogram object. Right? At first, naturally, when we look at a pulley system, uh, we're intuitively thinking, well, a heavy object pulls a lighter object. In this case here, what's happening here is we have a lighter object here potentially trying to pull a heavy object. How does this actually work out physically speaking? When we actually study a free body diagram here, we can actually address that question. What are the forces that act on this 3 kilogram mass? Well, we know gravity acts on it. I'm just going to call this object number 2. So Fg2, there is a tension force that's along the string here, uh, T2. That tension force is sort of transmitted along the string itself. It sort of goes all the way this way. This tension is going to be equal and opposite the tension that's going to be pulling on the 4 kilogram going the opposite way. So those two tension forces cancel out. So this is going to be a T1 going to the right. I know those cancel. Uh, my 4 kilogram here actually also has an Fg. Fg1 is actually going to be bigger than Fg2. That is correct. A heavy object here shouldn't be able to, uh, to be pulled by a lighter object. However, if you look at the directionality here, what could happen to the system is the free hanging mass here is just trying to pull downwards. It's trying to pull along uh, the ground here. It's actually just trying to cause this object here to actually go to the right. So in this setup here, it's not actually Fg2 directly against Fg1 like the earlier problem. It's actually, well, we have an Fg1. We have an Fn1. We have a normal force here on this first object. It's actually only fighting against friction. So sometimes if there's not enough roughness here, if the mu coefficient here is actually a little bit less, uh, it would actually, uh, the lighter object could actually slide the heavier object. Uh, in this competition here, you can make a note to yourself here, um, it's Fg. So we have uh, the gravity force on the hanging mass is against, right, who is he tug of warring against? He's tug of warring against the friction uh, force on the first mass. So it's not quite Fg2 fighting Fg1, it's Fg2 fighting against FF. If it were the Fg2's fighting, this object would just sit there. But in this case, you're looking at the directionality. Uh, the only thing that can stop this one here from sliding to the right is actually a friction force. Uh, let's just put some numbers to this here. Uh, let's say the mu coefficient is 0 0.10, um, and let's work our way through. So standard setup here. Uh, let's see if you can calculate the acceleration of the system. And then B, uh, see if you can find the tension along the string. There is only one string, so uh, you should be able to uh, do new to second law. You have to do the tension part afterwards because we have to know the individual accelerations for the different parts. So let's go our way through here. Fg1 is supposed to be mass times gravity, so 4 times 9.8. So 4 times 9.8 gives me here uh, 39.2. Because we are back on a flat surface, my Fn1 would also have to be 39.2. There's no one pushing down or up on it. It's just exactly cancelling so it can stay on the table surface. Ff is given by mu times Fn. Mu is 0 0.10 multiplied by the Fn, which is 39.2. Uh, that gives me a total friction force here of only 3.92. Let's see how hard the other mass is pulling. The other mass is uh, because of gravity, so 3 times 9.8. Mass times gravity. That gives you here 29.4. So what we have is actually a competition between this uh, 3 kilogram is being pulled down 29.4, but there's actually a really minimal friction. This surface here is actually so smooth, even though realistically we were actually a heavier object, we can see that the 29.4 wins. So in this case here, if we uh, deal with the system first, we deal with the 4 kilogram and the 3 kilogram. I know they're not quite touching each other, but because the tension forces just cancel out, the T1 and the T2s, those just sort of die away. We basically have our 3.92 is trying to keep this whole system from sliding to the right. 
the 29.4 that's acting on the 3 kilogram is trying to slide it uh, to the left or clockwise. Uh, in this case here we go bigger number minus smaller number again. The net force, how much is imbalanced? 29.4 minus 3.92 gives me here 25.48, so 25.5. Once you have the net force, you can find the acceleration. F net is equal to ma. 25.5 is unbalanced. We are a total system, again, of 7 kilograms, just coincidentally. Uh, this is equal to a. 25.48 divided by 7 gives me my whole acceleration is 3.6 meter per second squared. That is the system's acceleration. I'm going to leave you to find the tensions here. How are you going to do for the tensions? Because I know the system's acceleration, for the tension part, you can either do Newton's second law on this top mass or Newton's second law on the bottom mass. You don't have to do both. I did both earlier, just so that you can see that they're actually equal and opposite. Just choose whichever one is easier for you. In this case here, I'd probably say the second mass is easier. So we know that the acceleration is actually downwards, 3.6. We go bigger number minus smaller number. In this case here, so this is for part B, you should say something like Fg2 minus tension is equal to just this mass times it by um, the acceleration. It's not 9.8 because we're actually hooked up by this uh, free hanging pulley. On the other side here, a little more complicated because there's more arrows to it. Fg actually cancels out Fn, so those are gone. Don't need to worry about those. We're actually going to have a T1 that's being pulled, fighting against friction. Because again, I know the answer. I know the acceleration is actually go to the right. You can verify it for yourself. In this case here, it should be T1 minus friction. Because there's a net wind towards the right direction. This equals to just the mass of the first one uh, times the acceleration also of 3.6. That way, if you, you always go bigger number minus smaller number, we can always keep this acceleration as positive. And we'll never need to worry about, oh, it should be negative because it's going the opposite direction. So give that one a go here. You'll know you have the right answer if these two tensions actually match up to each other. All right? We'll pick it up from there tomorrow. Thanks, guys.